I know Mike Zanino hit a home run yesterday, but to me, he's shot as a ball player. You hoped he'd be an upgraded catcher. Somehow he's not been. I mean, Austin Hedges stinks too. Uh, he's pl- By the way, he's still playing every day for Pittsburgh pretty much. Uh, but he's no good. And Bo Naylor's time is now. I don't know why they're continuing to wait. Well, at this point, now you might as well wait until the Super 2 is out of the know. way. You've waited this long. Yeah. You, you know and that's, that's coming. I don't know the exact date. But it's got to be close. This is yes. the, this is the the downside to Tito. It ain't it ain't even a downside. It's just like you just know what it is. So, like if Tito get see you like look like you trying to get out of a slump, it look like you battle. He loves battling. He's like yeah, battle back, hit yeah. a couple home runs. Now all of a sudden that bought him three more weeks. <laughs> like, the, the, yeah, well, I said last when he threw the runner out at second, I turned around and said that just yeah. got him six more but, weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys see Brennan hit the bird yesterday, by the way? Yes. You know what? I was there and I didn't even realize. It. I didn't I was I, I didn't even notice it. And and I didn't, I didn't see till... much of the game yesterday, like I said, because I was out, so I was listening to a lot of it on the radio. But when I went back and looked at the highlight of it, I could really couldn't see it. I couldn't it that see well. it until someone tweeted out this angle this morning. Did he implode it? It's gonna be small for you guys, but yeah. watch it and it, it highlights the bird. Steve, you can take it and Anthony can play it. Yeah, we can't. can't see I can't see that. They'll, they'll highlight it. Hold on. They they do a little highlight. See that black dot? Boom, black I dot no longer dot. there. Oh, I saw that little. Why has it look- got the shady stuff on the side there? What is with that? It's. Oh yeah, that's. It means it's a, a cell phone recording, and it's uh, not the full yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it did hit a bird. Yeah, it, I see that little black dot. That black dot is no longer. And did you see his? Re- did you see his response though? I did. Will Brennan, give me Will Brennan, sweet aunt. Will Brennan he looked sad. at PETA and apologized. Earl called him a murderer last night. I, I woke up to wow. all these texts saying Earl. your favorite player is a murderer, and it turns out he just killed a bird unintentionally. Anthony, where's this tag board? What are the odds of that, man? Anthony forgot to load it into tag board, so <laughs> give us a second. <laughs> now, I'm going to call Anthony. it out. I said it to him this morning. I said, Anthony, make sure we got his response hey. in. Anthony, pull it together. You, hey. He forgot four times to bring the heads. The, 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 the pause. <laughs> <laughs> These heads. Yeah, These folks. heads. I, I'm uncomfortable with, uh, with, with, with men giving me, bringing me heads and stuff. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, and you know, and then he pulled a Randy Johnson. What did Will Brennan say? Well, he tagged Peta. Yeah. Will you read it? I'm gonna make yeah. sure Tom Hamilton is all set up because I just see there it is. Cube, but there he tagged is. Peta. I'm we truly sorry. An unfortunate sacrifice. And I'm thinking, buddy, don't poke the Peta bear. Hey, look, I, look. Like I think it's funny, whatever, but. Peter, so, Peter, be pouring blood on you. So, like, this was is, he trying to be funny? I, I assume he was, was trying he to be serious. Funny. Behind the scenes, no, he's trying to be funny. Be, the, behind the scenes, cool. I, behind the scenes, I've, I've been told there are five, and I'm not even gonna name the groups. I'm not even gonna say nothing. There are five groups that you don't mention and you don't act like they even oh, exist. I know one of them. Yeah, man. I know. Anthony Lima felt they yeah, were I, I, the bicycle have, people. I, I didn't say don't nothing. Don't mess with bicycle people. I, listen, I love um, all people. I love you all. You remember that yeah. when Lima yeah. made a joke about no, no, no. bike lanes and hitting a biker and we, we, people we, went bananas. We, we don't condone that. We love bicyclists. We like helmets and everything. And we like birds. I'm all not right. messing around with nothing. We got Tom Hamilton coming we on. We do. And Go we're ahead. going to the I guest can... hotline. And the guest hotline today is brought to us by Lorraine County Community College. Your class is your future. Register now for summer and fall classes. You can learn more at LorraineCCC.edu. You just heard my voice, which does not even come anywhere close in comparison no, to the legendary a terrible voice. Tom <laughs> Hamilton's. I feel bad introducing Tom with such a terrible voice for an Avery. But there is the legendary Tom Hamilton joining us now on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. What's up, Tom? Hi guys, how are you? Tom, good, Tom, do you have any people that send you demo tapes? Like you're so good yes. at your job. Do people send you demos and say, do I have a chance? Yeah, you know, especially um, you get young guys that are maybe, you know, doing college games or minor league games or whatnot. So, you know, you're always happy to listen to those and offer any advice if you can or if they want advice or are looking for, you know, any tips. I mean, to me, that's always the least you can do is, you know, try to help the next generation coming up because we're all there at one time. What do you, you do know? if they're terrible? Um, <laughs> <laughs> he hires someone like you to call him back and say that was horrible. <laughs> that was trash. Jason Lloyd. Yeah. Have you tried Trying to be politically correct? <laughs> That could be awkward. 
Hey, Tom, uh, last night, uh, one of the many things I love about your broadcast style, I'm listening to the end of the game with you. I was driving home, listening to the game, and I feel like way too many hometown announcers, if there's a bad ball strike call in favor of their team, never admit that. Yeah. And in the bottom of the eighth, I can't remember now if it was Rosario or Ramirez that Santos threw a pitch and he thought it was strike three. And you and you said, yeah, they missed the call. I feel like so many hometown announcers won't do that. And I really appreciate your honesty because I think that's what announcers should do. And I love that you do that. Well, I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And um, I think I've gotten better as I've gotten older as far as, you know, too many times early in my career, I think I was way too critical of umpires. And, you know, these guys are the best at what they do. They're trying to do the right job. And a lot of times we may think it was the wrong call. We find out that it was the right call. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, they're going to miss calls. I mean, yeah. they're human. And sometimes your club's the beneficiary of that. And sometimes you're on the other end of that spectrum. But, I mean, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's been said time and again, there might be a rare exception, but very seldom does it come down uh, to one call. Now, I, I could make an exception about Joe Brinkman in game six of the 95 World Series, yes. you know, when the plate went from 17 to 22 inches, and it was that way from inning number one. Uh, Cleveland was in trouble with Tom Glavin on the, on the mound for Atlanta. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's usually the guys wearing the uniforms that are going to decide whether you win or lose not the ref or not the umpire. Tom, curious, uh, with the new rules this year, I know as a fan, I enjoy the speed of the game. As mm -hmm. a broadcaster who's been calling games for a long time, how much of an adjustment has it been for you because you, the pace is quicker? How, how tough has that been, if at all? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, from a radio standpoint, and having done – college basketball on TV for 25 years. I felt like I had a, a feel for how it was to do television too. Television, you can talk over certain plays or pitches or whatnot because the camera is providing the play-by-play. -play. So if your partner has something to say, you don't need to interrupt them and say, here's the pitch. Right. Or, you know, here's the shot or whatever the case might be. A lot different in radio. And so it's been a lot tougher in my opinion, for Rosie and I to have as much back and forth. If Logan Allen's on the mound, you're lucky to say, here's the windup in the pitch. He's, he's <laughs> almost winding up and delivering when he's gotten the throwback from the catcher. So I, I definitely feel on radio, it, it has been an impact. Now, I don't know how Matt and Archie feel about it on TV, but again, you can talk over of yeah. what's going on because you can see what's going on. And radio, if, if you're talking over and missing plays or pitches or whatnot, um, you know, that's a disservice to your listeners. And so oh, wow. it's it's been quicker. It, uh, I don't think we've lost anything. I know some people feel like the game is too fast. I don't get that. All we've done is, is cut out dead time. That's I right. mean, I, I'm trying to remember, guys, was last night 206 or yeah. – I mean, we had a 206 game Sunday night in New yeah. York. I think that's what it was last night. Yeah, whatever it was, 215 or whatever. Um, that's the way it should be if that yes. if there isn't much scoring. There wasn't there weren't many hard hit balls. No. And um, so why should that be a three hour game? You know the thing I don't know that it's been talked about a lot, guys. And I may be dead wrong. My feeling is the pitch clock has impacted the last three innings of the game more as far as who's pitching them. Those guys that were pitching in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and still are, are guys that were trying to maximize velocity. And so they took as much time as they could between pitches so they could throw 97 or 98 or whatnot. I mean, how many times did we say, man, the game was flying along until the bullpen got involved? And they were the guys that were the slowest workers, especially your closer. I think the element we've added to our game this year, and I like it, I don't think the last part of the game is as predictable as it was anymore. You're not seeing as many, okay, 
it's the ninth inning, this game's over. You might as well turn the radio off, turn the TV off, go to bed. It's not the case. Yeah. Emmanuel Class A leads baseball with 16 saves, yet he's had five blown saves. Right. I don't want there to be no drama at the end of the game. There's nothing better than comebacks in the last innings. Look, we were on the wrong end of it in New York where you had the lead in every one of those ball games or had a chance to win every one of those games until the Mets won them in the eighth inning or later. That's the element of the game I thought we were losing. I thought the end of games had become so predictable because the bullpens were so dominant before the pitch clock. I don't think that's the case this year. Yeah, I agree. Tom, I was there last night. I was trying to write a column on Zanino and Josh Bell and how they've been a disappointment in free. The free agents just haven't lived up to the paychecks that they're cashing. And I was three quarters of the way through the column and I'm typing and typing and typing. And Mike Zanino goes, boom. It hits a two-run homer in the seventh or eighth. And I looked at Zach Meisel, and I closed the laptop with one finger, and I said, well, this one's going to have to wait a couple of days. But, I mean, obviously, Zanino has struggled quite a bit this year, both behind the plate mm-hmm. and at the plate. How long do you think the leash is, and how long until – it is Bo Naylor a, an option at this point? Even Chris Antonetti yesterday said before the game, it, it's been a disappointment. It hasn't gone – the way that they anticipated. And Chris is never really critical of anyone. So for him to even say that, I thought, okay, well, maybe the clock really is ticking now. I think at some point it is, Jason. But I think the clock is always ticking on everybody in the game. I don't think it matters. Um, The one thing, I I know it's trite, but you've heard it time and again with baseball, and I'm sure you could say it about other sports too. Look, the train is always moving. Uh, You either get on the train or the train passes you by. And so I don't care who the player is. Um, at some point, teams run out of patience. Now, I think with Mike Zanino, you know, he only played 30-some ball games last year. That's a very serious surgery that he had because you're cutting into muscles, you're cutting into all that area, ligaments and whatnot, when you have that thoracic outlet syndrome surgery to improve your circulation. Now, maybe it is on his non-throwing arm. But... You know, anybody that throws a ball knows that front shoulders, your lead shoulder, that comes into play when you throw the baseball or if you're throwing a football. I mean, a quarterback can't have a bad left shoulder and still be a good thrower if he's right-handed. So I think with Mike Zanino, they're trying to be as patient as they can, knowing he is still not back 100% and that it's still a work in progress. I think he's gotten better at blocking balls in the dirt. Um, He threw a runner out last night, which is the first he's done in a while. Uh, Again, when when these guys have the track record that they have, they're going to get more of a leash. You're going to be a little bit more patient with them. But Bo Naylor is going to make a case to be up here pretty soon. And so the good thing is, is that you might have somebody if you have a need in that position. And so uh, I'm curious to see what last night does for Mike. If this maybe really gives him a jump start and gets him back to being the player that he's been throughout his career. But, um, you know, again, I think we know who the catcher of the future is here in Cleveland. You know, Hammy, you talked about the the train moving and, um, you know, when you look at the right field position, you know, last year, it looked like the, the guardians had found, you know, an Oscar Gonzalez, you know, their long-term answer out there. Um, but this year, Will Brennan has been playing um, well. He's been mixing in that, into that uh, rotation. Do you think? Um, how do you think this ends? How do you? Who was the real long-term answer? And how long do you think the platoon will still go on with you know two young players? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, with young players, you have to be patient. And I, I think what we found here when both Oscar and Will were here. There's just not enough at bats. Uh, I think for young players more so, obviously, than a veteran who's maybe near the end of the line, they've never sat their entire life. I mean, let's face it. If you're Will Brennan or you're Oscar Gonzalez, you've been the best player on the team since you were able to put on a pair of pants and and play t-ball or Little League or wherever you may have started. You've never sat. You've never sat in the minor leagues because you're a prospect that needs to play. You get up to the major leagues, the toughest level there is, and now they're telling you, man, you might only play once or twice this week. That It was an adjustment that Oscar Gonzalez couldn't make. He needed to go to Columbus and get the advance that he's getting now to get back up here 
Embiid maybe that power threat that we thought he was going to be. The problem right now for Oscar is it's not happening in Columbus either. And mm-hmm. so to me, that's an even bigger concern. Um, for Will Brennan, it is it, it hasn't been a great start, but he's had better at bats than you know, and again, I know it's a result based business, but sometimes you can tell when a guy when the game is starting to beat him up. And that's what they felt like with Oscar Gonzalez, that he was just kind of overwhelmed and beaten before he got to the plate. Will Brennan has had much better at bats, even though he he doesn't have great numbers, that Will Brennan is going to get more time out there. But as you're seeing, Gabriel Arias is a guy, they feel like they've got to have him in the lineup. I think Gabby, uh, Gabby, I know it's Gabriel, but he is called Gabby. He's the point that I think you're also making in that he's got to play. I think his time is right now to be playing every day or close to it. He's the best shortstop on the club, even though you've got a good one in Ahmed Rosario. So I think you're going to see Arias get a lot more at bats at various positions on the diamond. But uh, Tito talked about Arias on the road trip, and he was like, this is a guy we cannot get impatient with because that light is going to come on, and when it does, he's got a chance to be special. Tom, where, where the the lineup and the bullpen have struggled, the rotation seems to be really settling in right now. Bybee's been very good. Logan Allen's been very good. We know Bieber hasn't been at his best this year, but he's coming off a good start against the Mets. We know he's not going anywhere at the moment. We know Quantrill's in the rotation. That's four certain spots, okay? Went, and we got uh, uh, McKenzie and Savali both getting close to coming back, and Gavin Williams is just dominating in the minors. It's a good problem to have. What is your? What do you think by the time we – assuming guys are healthy, and it probably won't be because somebody else will get hurt or whatever, but assuming all these guys stay healthy at this point, what's your best guess as to what this rotation looks like second half of the season? Ooh. It's tough. I didn't, prep, I didn't prep enough for this show. <laughs> <laughs> These are good questions, guys. No, I, I think I'm, I'm going to start with Gavin Williams, Bull. Yeah. First off, the reason we haven't seen Gavin Williams is twofold. One, they don't want to rush him. You know, sure. he's only made four AAA starts, I believe it is. To your point, he has dominated every level Ooh. he's been at in the farm system. Completely overmatched hitters. Yeah. They still want him to get better at all of his secondary pitches because right now in the minor leagues, he can beat them with two pitches. Sometimes you have to come to the major leagues and get beat up because you're only throwing two pitches to get that point that, hey, okay, you got to go back and work on your curveball and changeup as well. But that's one thing. He needs more time. He's not on the 40-man. So when you move him to the 40-man, you've got to be moving him to stay, not just moving him to come up here for one or two starts. Right. The other thing that I think is also holding Gavin Williams back right now, they have to find out about the two guys you mentioned that should be back right at the end of this month or the 1st of June, Tristan McKenzie and Aaron Savali. They're going to get the first opportunity. So you're going to have Shane Bieber. You're going to have Logan Allen. You're going to have Tanner Bybee in that rotation. And then you're going to get Aaron Savali and Tristan McKenzie here within the next 10 days to two weeks. That is then when decisions are going to be made because guys are going to have to, again, perform. We, we just got talking about how long are you patient with certain guys. This is now a great situation to have where you guys like Bo Naylor and Gavin Williams, they're, they're knocking on the door and they're not going away. And so what I think is, and, and you know, then last night, Hunter Gaddis came out of nowhere. We've never seen Hunter Gaddis as good as he was last night, but that also shows you the potential that he has because he did it against a ball club that was red hot coming into last night's ball game. Look, guys, you cannot have enough starting pitching. We all know that. Uh, I think as, as disappointing as the start has been, in one sense, it's been remarkable that you're talking about the starters actually being pretty good. You're also talking about it with three rookies in the rotation right now True. because Zach Plesak's not here, and we know about Savali and McKenzie. M- remember, guys, a couple of years ago when you lost Bieber, Savali, and Plesak, season was over. You you were never able to recover from that. The fact that this club is able to kind of almost kind of you know um, almost dog paddle 
and and stay afloat here without going under until you get all your starters back is is saying something about the future. So I think the second half of this year obviously gets very interesting. The Shane Bieber topic is going to be there all season long. Um, you can't avoid it. You know, Shane's heard it. Again, from what I understand now, obviously I couldn't hear the, the ESPN telecast on Sunday night since we're also doing the game. But um, the word was I heard from people that when they did talk about Cleveland, their talk was about Shane Bieber and would he be traded and who might he be traded to. Right. You're going to continue to hear that because Shane Bieber has, in essence, a year and a half left before he's a free agent at the end of 2024. And so I think that comes into the equation as well. Tom, is there any concern over Classe? The peripheral numbers, the saves obviously are yeah. there, but you mentioned the blown saves. The, the velocity hasn't been there at times this year. Is there any concern with him at all, or is it he's going to be fine? And, Tom, you, no, I, I, you mentioned – in fact, it reminded me when Jason was saying this because on the broadcast last night, you made the point of saying how his strikeouts are way down this year. Mm-hmm. That has been yeah. one concern. You know, he the one thing, guys, which to me is astounding, for a guy that can throw 100 miles an hour and a slider, he's never been a big strikeout guy. No. However, no. he was a strikeout in inning last year. Now, a lot of guys, like when Karen Jack was going good last year, he averaged two strikeouts in inning. Right. Clausey's never been that guy. I, I don't know why guys put the bat on the ball with him with the kind of stuff he has, but they worked with – his arms swing a little bit. That was a little bit shorter than it had been. That's why they felt like he had lost some velocity. Yet he's still throwing 98 miles an hour and then throwing sliders last night at 93 miles an hour. The biggest thing Tito said, we talked about it uh, in his office last night, Class A, he's been off just this much. And again, it shows you how good these guys are in the major leagues that he's off just this much and that makes him more hittable than he was a year ago. It's all about location with him. He, he got ahead the other night, 0-2, and he hung a slider. And, you know, the ball was hit out of the ballpark. And so he, when he's made a mistake, you know, it's gotten hit. He hasn't been quite as sharp as a year ago. But, no, I, I know some people are worried that his velo is down maybe two miles an hour. They feel that's due to the arm swing and some of the mechanics of his delivery. I thought last night he looked as good as we've seen him. Um, I think Tito commented after the ball game. I haven't talked to Tito yet today, but uh, he said he threw that slider like he was angry. And, you know, Emmanuel Class A isn't used to, to having blown saves. So, no, um, I think, the you know, the other thing, too, is as Tito mentioned, we have had 23 one-run games mm -hmm. every night there's your one mistake away from getting beat because you haven't been able to open up games. I mean, we scored three runs last night and that felt like a big lead going into the late innings. <laughs> and did. you know, that that's part of the problem. You just, yeah. when is the last time this ball club, I thought we were going to have it Friday night, but when's the last time they went into a game late up six to one, seven to one. And it was kind of like automatic. Just hasn't happened. I can't no. remember. No, you know, no. Along, along that uh, that line of trying to thought. Um, when you look at it, as far as the power numbers are concerned, um, do you think does Tito think that they'll eventually, you know, get themselves to be middle of the road, or are they planning for this being the long haul? Like, hey, this is what we are. We're going to just find mm. different ways to win some ball games. Well, they have to get better. Um, you know, they, they, if you can't win this way, you just, you, you can't win never hitting home runs again, look the it's a one, nothing game last night going into the late innings. We don't know how that turns out. It sure seemed different with a two run home run, didn't it? I mean, it's just amazing what a two or a three run home run does late in the game. Something we just kind of haven't gotten used to because it hasn't been happening around here. Um, if they don't hit for more power, it's going to be a struggle all year offensively. And I think, you know, it, it, Ahmed, Rosa, or Ahmed Rosario is not going to be a power hitter, but he's starting to hit. The, the guy that has to come around is Andre Jimenez. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy doesn't have to hit 25 home runs, but, you know, he's just really tried to do too much this year. We have really missed his bat that we had a year ago. Um, Josh Bell, 
you know, obviously has not hit for a lot of power. He's walking a lot. He's getting some big hits, but you know, we're not seeing maybe 25 or 30 home runs from that position. Uh, I don't know where the power is going to come from. You know, again, you kind of, I hate to always fall back on last year, but in some ways last year was kind of magical. Every time you brought somebody up, they got hot for a week or so. It was unbelievable yeah. to have 17 guys make their major league debut. And it seemed like every one of them played well for a week or two as soon as they got up here. Um, you miss that power of Oscar Gonzalez that we talked about. That threat of winning a game or blowing a game open with one swing of the bat. We just don't have that right now. Josh, you know, if you're going to count on Josh Naylor to hit 40 home runs, you're going to be disappointed. And if he tries to hit 40 home runs, he's going to have a bad year. Right now, I don't see a guy on this ball club outside of Jose Ramirez that's a 30 home run guy. So, you know, hopefully we get more power. I think we have to get more power from whom you have here. It doesn't have to be guys hitting 30 or 40 home runs, but I think what you've got to see are, you know, more guys hitting 15 to 20 home runs. And so you have more of a threat up and down the lineup. Look, guys. The power is either here or you don't have it. This is what you have offensively, unless maybe an Oscar Gonzalez gets hot or whatnot, or if you make a trade and you try to get a hitter in that trade, which means you're going to be giving up pitching to get that kind of a bat. And I, I don't know how many people are going to trade you that, that bat. What you need to do is find a matchup. If you feel like you have a surplus to starting pitching, you need to find another team that, has a surplus of power bats and is in need of pitching. Otherwise, it's the guys that are here. They either get it done or they don't. Yeah, I think they need to get a power hitting right fielder and frankly, a platoon partner for Naylor because I just don't want him playing against lefties that can, you know, hit some home runs against lefties. We'll see. Last thing, Tom, the obviously, well, not just the American League Central, both Central divisions are absolutely <laughs> atrocious. But specifically on the American League Central, is this as bad as you've seen it? Because, I mean, it feels like the Guardians have lost every night for the last month, and yet they're three games out of first. I mean, I don't think anybody's yeah. that good in this division. I, I'm I'm really surprised. Um, I, I might be beating the drum for no reason. I still think Chicago, on paper, is a really good ball club. Yeah. I think in Pedro Grafal, they've got a guy that can be a really good manager. And, um, you know, they've been playing better as of late. You know, they, they still are a little banged up. They just have a hard time staying healthy. But in Luis Robert, I think you have the next superstar in our game that maybe not enough people realize yep. how special he is. In Tim Anderson at the top of their order, you've got a guy that's a perennial batting champ contender, and he's already won a batting title. And, and he's one of the most electric players in the American League from an offensive standpoint. Their starting pitching is really good. They have so many power arms in their bullpen. I, I don't know why, you know, they got off to such a horrific start. They were 14 and 28 that that's a, that's a chasm to try to dig yourself out of, but don't discount the White Sox. Yeah. Um, they, they still have way too much talent for this to continue. Obviously it's Minnesota. Uh, the other team that you mentioned along with Cleveland, because I know Detroit's been a surprise. We'll see. Um, in Kansas City is just having a really tough start. So I thought the division was going to be better. And quite honestly, we're lucky it's not. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. Tom, you're the best. We appreciate it. As Thank always, you, thank guys. you for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for having me, guys. Always appreciate fun. Appreciate it. Tom Hamilton. Thank he you. He's the best.